So, um, hi everyone, and welcome to my talk, multi threading model in Parallax games, the past, the present, and the future. All right, so um, where do we start? Well, I guess I like to start by like some kind of tweet or quote I found on the internet. And while researching this talk, I, I wondered what the internet thought about uh, multi-threading in, uh, in, in Paradox game, the games that my company makes. Uh, and that's the first answer I found with someone asking on Steam, how do we use multi-threading in Paradox game? Like, is it even possible? Maybe there's some software trick. What's the, what's the secret? So uh, to give this person the answer and everybody else live the answer, there is a trick. There is, there is the greatest trick of all. Uh, the best way to do it is at level seven, you pick improved software trick. Um, at level 13, you pick greater software trick. It considers the software trickster prestige class, and it works better with a gnome or cat folk. But honestly, if you want to do it as a dwarf, that's a great challenge. I encourage you to try. All right. Um, joking aside, why, why is someone asking for this? What's, well, what's the rationale behind the question? Why are, why are players asking, hey, how do you, how do you use multi in the games? So uh, as you can see, this is a, a curve of like the clock speed of most like desktop processors, especially I think it's Intel, uh, over the past 20, 30 years. It actually stopped in 2010, but honestly, it's because the curve is basically flat after that, uh, after that time to some extent. Uh, this is a well-known fact that the clock speeds, uh, the, the rush for better clock speed has stopped somewhere in the early 2000s. And since then, the CPU have still gotten better and better and meaner but they have not been better by just having more, uh, more clock speed. Uh, instead, we went to another direction. Uh, and this is, this is some averages I, compute, I computed from the Steam hardware survey. This is the average number of cores that the, uh, the player base has uh, depending on the year. And you can see that about roughly almost 10 years ago now, they had about three in average, which leads me to believe most people had between two and four, although three cores was, I think, a thing. Uh, and nowadays, um, you have an average around five, which gives me to believe people are somewhere between the four and six to eight uh, number of cores. Again, it's an average, and if it's an odd number, there's a good chance that it's actually somewhere in between. I don't think many machines have five cores. But new hardware uh, came with new challenges, right? Because the big idea was, okay, this core is getting too big and too hot. We can't get it any better. So uh, let's split it and just uh, instead of just figuring out how to make one bigger core, faster core, we're just going to ship four cores instead and, and we're going to call it a day. The problem is uh, for us programmers, it doesn't scale as well. Uh, if you wrote a game uh, in, the, in the 90s and you run it in the 2000s, it would just be faster by the simple virtue of the CPUs uh, being much faster. Today, it is still true because there is still some improvement being made on the execution pipeline itself of the CPU, but a lot of the progress has been made to making more cores available, and basically that doesn't come magically off. You, The programmers need to do something about it. And so, hi, my name is Mathieu. I'm the tech lead at Paradox. Uh, I'm one of the tech leads at Paradox, because you're the tech lead of Hearts of Iron 4. Uh, strategy game about uh, World War II. Uh, I will, uh, we will show a bit uh, later what it looks like. Uh, and before that, I was a, a gameplay programmer on both Stellaris and Europa Universalis, two of the games that we will briefly mention. And I am here today to talk to you about the importance of multi-threading. Uh, you probably uh, already hear about the importance of multi-threading, especially here at this conference. And you may have questions like this fan had, and I think I can demystify some of it and maybe hammer home the point that it is really, really a crucial thing to, uh, to consider if you're making uh, a modern desktop application today. So we're going to talk about concurrency models and actually concurrency model in practice illustrated by the, the way we try to do concurrency in all video games uh, in history. And some tips and tricks maybe that can be uh, taken and uh, some lessons from what we, uh, we tried over, over, over the time. Uh, there's a few profile screenshots that will be shown uh, in, uh, in this talk. Contrary to my talk yesterday, this is not a talk about profiling, so I will not do profiling live. Uh, the one that are made an optic have most of the time been done on my development workstation at the office, which has four cores and eight threads. Uh, the VTune profiles and the demos will be done on this machine right here, my home PC, which is a bit more recent and has 16 uh, threads. So just, just in case you're wondering what's the dis discrepancy between like the core usage, it's probably due to that. So why multi-threading? 
why is this guy uh, on Steam asking what's the what's the software trick to do to get multi-threading in, in a video game he likes to play? And it's it's an interesting question because if you're anything like me or older than me, I studied computer science in 2001 to 2006. And uh, it's not like this was a new concept. Back in school, I studied PFP thread, I think in like two or three different years. The, the, the concept is not new. I think they were introduced in 95, according to my researchers. And the minute we got like a Java uh, class, we also had the, the, the old Java uh, thread class to do, you know, like the thing when you have like five threads trying to say hello and it just garbles the console or whatever else you like to do. We, we, had, we had introductions to pthreads. That was something that was done. And I think most software engineering classes today uh, and, and probably also 20 years ago would cover the basics. We'll tell you, yep, you have you have threads, you can run several at the same time and you have mutexes and you have semaphores and you have all those ways to synchronize them. The thing is known, but again, if you're anything like me, you, you, you know all that stuff and then you mostly forget about it to some extent because in practice, you don't use it that much. Uh, and if, if I have to ask myself why, I think the big answer is, well, if you live in the desktop world, like machines with more than CPU, by the way, for the rest of this talk, Physical threads, hardware threads, hardware cores, multiple CPU. I, I just use it as the same kind of ID in the talk. It's basically uh, a machine that is able to run concurrently some code uh, at the same time. Not, not just because they have a magical scheduler that just commutes processes, but just because there is several execution units on the machine. So for that purpose, the first really, uh, the first real like consumer grade machine that could do that was probably the Pentium uh, with hyper threading, the Pentium 4 with hyper threading, which basically faked having two cores uh, using some hardware trickery, uh, but it was still like very high end. And I think half the operating systems could not even use it. And even if you had an operating system that could use it, it was just so niche that most software did not really bother with it. Uh, actual physical cores, uh, I think you have to wait 2005 for like the, the call to duo or something like that to happen uh, to actually uh, start being a thing, or maybe the Pentium D, also a thing that didn't really catch on that much. And if again, if we follow with the, the story of Intel, I think you wait 2010 to basically be guaranteed that anyone buying a computer tomorrow will have at least two cores. And I think I think it shows because. At the end of the day, of course, the, the efficiency of multi-threading is, 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 is entirely limited by the number of execution units you have on your machine, right? And over-subscription is usually worse for performance than under-subscription. Like, you have, you, you start having, uh, you start spending your time in schedulers if you if you have more, uh, more active threads than you have execution units. I used to work in, uh, my first job was, uh, was in web, server, web servers. And at the time we were in a, in a study between different web servers and one of them was Apache. And Apache was the worst on the market at the time for the simple reason that every time it gets a new request to serve, it just creates a new thread. Which means if you have a bot that just sends like 10,000 HTTP simple requests to get a static file, Apache just dies because it, it just swarms your, your machine with like a million threads and they're all, always like doing a little bit of work and then being commuted out by the, by the scheduler of the OS to do something else. And it's just terrible. So... Basically, the, the, the rule of the thumb that, especially in the server world, we already had back in the 2000s when I was working there was do not create more work for us than you have cores. And that is still a rule that is fairly uh, solid today. Do not have more work for us than you have cores. But of course, then here is the thing, right? For the longest time, the average desktop does not have more than one core. Maybe two if you're lucky. So how many work thread do you spawn? One. And that's already the thread you start on because you have a main thread when you, when you start an application. So, well, Basically, since it's hard to write and there's not a lot of hardware to do that, you kind of forget about it. And you keep it for specific things like async, for example. Like, okay, if I have to do a task and I know that this task will just basically sleep on something, yeah, I'll push an async operation with a thread and then I'll just wait on the future or something like that. That is, that is technically multi-threading, but you're not actually uh, computing stuff faster. Uh, you're just trying to get the wait time out of the way. It's not a bad thing but it's a different paradigm. But the times are changing and they're changing fast. Uh, still, still based on the numbers I crunched from, um, from the Steam hardware survey, this is the, the average physical core count uh, on the player base. And as you can see, uh, up until 2016, 
like at least have the player base. You don't have more than two cores, but it's it's dying fast. And now most machines have at least four cores, like at more than half, like twenty more than 25, 25, 75 percent, more than seventy five percent, almost 85 percent of them have, have four cores or more. So if you're only using one, the 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 the, the bang you're getting out of the out of the uh, computer computer consumer CPU is really really low. Uh, I translated that into this graph, uh, which is basically if you're only forking while well, using one uh, one uh, one thread, like how 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 much are you getting out of it? And as you can see, like ten years ago, even uh, you still got like almost half of the performance of the machine, which is uh, to some extent not that bad. Uh, nowadays, you you're not getting like you're getting less than twenty five percent of the of the machine firepower, firepower. If you uh, if you do that, just, just do not do that. This is this is really not a good thing to do. So, again, if you if you if you don't have multi-threading computations in your in your program, not just like background threads, but just multi-threading computation, if you do not have it, you will use it about twenty-five percent of the user-based processing power on average, including like low-end machines. Uh, it is not a bonus anymore. It is not just something you reserve for servers or high-end desktops. Everybody needs to use it. Of course, code needs to adapt, and this is where the challenge comes on. Come in. So now, with all that in mind, let's see how at Paradox we work with that. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting and funny at the same time because we are a company that is well known for making historical strategy games and having a, a fan base that is really devoted uh, uh, into learning about history. So I guess. Here's the history of historical strategy games. So to look at the, at the timeline of the releases we had in the 2013 for the people in the, in the room who are not super familiar with our games. Uh, 2013, we released Europe Universalis 4, uh, which is still in production today. And I think as a DLC announced uh, to come next month, if I'm not mistaken, it's, it's our oldest production game that is still getting actively developed. Uh, before that, it was Crusader Kings 2, but it was retired last year. Uh, Hearts of Iron is the one I work on, released in 2016. Uh, the other one released the same year was 2000, uh, it was Stellaris. Uh, for, the, for the story, I think one of those was supposed to release a year before or after, but production uh, it, it is what it is, and they actually turned out to be released one month away from each other. Um, 2019, it's, it, 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 we waited three years and then we, we, we got like Imperator Rome, which, uh, which is, uh, it was more shortly than all other games. Uh, and the biggest one we made recently that, um, uh, some of you may have played because it's probably our, uh, most, uh, like wide, wider, widest audience we had so far is Crusader Kings 3, uh, a game about medieval, uh, plots and, uh, and, and, and conflicts. Uh, and somewhere in the future, uh, I do not have a release date yet, will be Victoria 3, which has been announced, but is not uh, out yet. So that's roughly a timeline of what has Paradox been up to the last 10 years in terms of releases. And I will arbitrarily draw a line in the middle here uh, on the generation between the games. And I will basically say that everything to the left is basically the past in terms of like generation and how we handled, uh, we, we, we tried to attack threading. Uh, anything to the right is more like the present era and everything after that, well, it's the future. Who knows what it holds? So we have one engine in the company. Its name is Klauswitz, named after the um, German uh, war uh, theorician of the 19th and 18th century, if I recall correctly, Karl von Klauswitz. Uh, it's it's the same engine we have been using for a long time. We keep updating it. Uh, basically, every game uh, every game gets a, a, an updated version of it. Up until Imperator, uh, all the games forked the engine at some point during the development and were not actively the engine was not actively maintained for them anymore. They would just have to backport fixes if they needed to. Otherwise, they would just go with uh, with whatever they had. Uh, starting Imperator and especially Sir Crusader Kings 3, we have decided to try to have a more live model. So that's why I'm trying to put them in a more recent category because those games, even if they have shape, we're still getting uh, results and, and improvements from the newer uh, from the newer developments. And there's also a big generational jump that happened between Stellaris and Imperator. Uh, In-house, we call it Germany. 
uh, again from another military theorician, this time from, uh, from Switzerland. Uh, it is a set of extra libraries that are not part of the engine, but are common to a lot of, uh, of grand strategy games because that's the main type of game we do. Uh, and do do set of libraries are the one that power up the basis of Imperator, CK3, and Victoria. And it's not exactly those libraries that changed everything, but it's a very simple colloquial way uh, internally to tell about games who are using the old engine versus the current engine. So, Technically speaking, I would put the arbitrary start of the old generation with Crusader Kings 2, uh, because as far as I could uh, go back in history in our Git and SVN repositories, it's the first one that seemed to have uh, multi framing as a base feature that was not just uh, uh, a small gimmick and, and was really trying to do some computation using uh, several threads. Uh, it's mostly done through TBB uh, or an equivalent of TBB. Uh, thread building blocks, uh, which is a library from Intel for those who have never used it. Uh, and it's mostly focused on speeding up the world simulation. Basically, we use multi threading mostly to uh, uh, simulate the passage of time in, in our historical game faster. I think before I continue, it's probably important for you to get a sense of how our game looks like and what I mean by passage of time. So, do you know time? If I click here real quick. And no, okay, again, do it again here, here, and hearts of fire and four beta. Yes, you're getting a beta build that I mean, especially for uh, for CPP con. All right, let's play it. Uh, this is a this is a work in progress build for the for the, the big DLC and uh, an update that should release. Uh, Actually, next month. I have cut down the sound for you. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but I was not so sure it would uh, sound so great. As you can see, this is a game about World War II. Uh, the, the imagery is all about uh, the big the big war that, that, that lasted uh, from 39 to 45. And technically, the game starts a bit before. So to give you an idea of the game, you can pick any nation in the world in January uh, 1, 1936. Uh, we have a bunch of few uh, suggested uh, nations, of course, which are the big players in World War II. But technically speaking, you can pick any country in the world that you want. Like uh, if you want to play as Uruguay in, uh, in 1936 and, and, and the world in World War II, you can. I would not recommend that. I don't think they are a very fun country to play. But technically you can. And every country that you do not play is simulated by the game anyway by an AI. So uh, let's start with Italy. Um, why not? It should start pretty fast, especially on this machine. One, two, three, go. Wow. OK, there we go. Cool. So you're put in, in control of Italy in 1936. You can see the clock at the top that says uh, it's 12 o'clock on January 1936. And everything is frozen. Time is frozen. Uh, you can even see the date line, the date, uh, the day and night cycle. So you can see that it's 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 day in Europe and it's and it's night in the in the Americas at that moment. It's because the the, the, hour, the hour is basically based on Europe time. Uh, and nothing moved. Everything is static. It's it's a people say it's a real time game. I think it is maybe true. Real time possible is another description. I would say it's a turn based, but that that well, it's not really. It's, it's it's turn based that continues unless you until you, you post them. So I guess real time real time possible is a, is a good description. Uh, we just say grand strategy, and that's that simple. So there's a lot of things you can do, right? So you can uh, you can pick a, a focus for your country, which gives you like an idea of uh, which direction the politics of the country should go, which means you can do the historical thing or, or go the way. You have a research tree, like most of uh, most video games do know what it is. We can research new play models, new industry, new tanks, lots of things like that. You also manage the production of your country. You also uh, build new factories. And of course, since it's a war game, you uh, manage the army. So for example, if I create an army here, I can give them a general uh, like this man. And then I can set a front line with uh, Ethiopia. And then I can give them an order to prepare a plan to invade Ethiopia. It's 1936, and Italy is on its way to invade Ethiopia. And as you can see, I give an order to my uh, to my unit to prepare for an attack. I can even tell the general, hey, start an attack now. But nothing happens. Because again, it's real time possible, and the world is static. And nothing happens until I say so. And I say so by uh, basically boosting up the speed and unposing the game. And then if I unpose the game just a bit, You'll see that my unit will start moving and they'll start doing stuff. And you'll see that day and night will start passing as the as, as you can see, follow the, you can even follow the sunlight in the game if uh, if that's your thing. 
and 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 the combats will be happening. And that's the base idea of every other game. You can pause at any time. We we simulate the passage of time with uh, with some kind of unit. Uh, in the case of, uh, of of Hearts of Fire, it's hours. For some others, it's going to be days. Uh, and uh, you either at a certain time or you at the time after, and there is no in between. We that that's how our simulation is run. It's very atomic in that sense. Uh, and of course, the question is how fast can it go? So the solution to that is, is, is to use the magical speed five. Speed five in the game means render and update the time as fast as the game can possibly run on your machine. Uh, all the other speeds, basically there's a timer in the game that say, hey, it's probably time to simulate a new hour now. If you put speed five, it's just go as fast as you can, which is usually what I use to benchmark how fast it goes. So let's unpause and see. As you can see, Time is passing quite fast. You barely, you, you, you can barely see the, the day and night moving because it's just moving too fast. And you can uh, you can see how fast the, uh, the, the the clock is ticking and the, and the fights are going. Uh, so we can see that there's a battle happening here that is simulated. And you see that uh, Ethiopia is moving here. I can give an order to someone to stop moving there and you will see them moving. So that's that's basically the, 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 the gist of it. This is, this is how the game works and this is how it simulates uh, time passing. Now, let's go back to uh, our slides for a moment. Actually, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave the game open for now. Uh, we, might, we might come back to it later. So uh, how does the loop work? What's the basic game loop? So if you remember the talk I did, like, like lightning talk I did uh, that explained the very basic uh, game loop of a, of a, of a game uh, last year at, uh, at SPPCon, it was something like this. You handle the input, you update the simulation, you render, and then you loop again. That's, that's the basic idea of how you make a video game. And if you look at our games, it is not much far from that. It is basically almost that. The difference is we have a command system uh, that is the only one that can change the game state. The, way, the basic idea is since our, our game, uh, the, the, the change of the game, uh, of the state of the game has to be atomic uh, for several reasons, one of them being multiplayer and others being the way we simulate time. Uh, the only change that can happen is when you process a command. So basically when I, uh, when I was in the game and I actually right click, I did not do anything, like it doesn't do anything, it doesn't change the game immediately. Instead, it sends a command to the server saying, hey, this player has given this order to those troops. The server processes it and then executes it in the next, in the next process command cycle. And that modifies the game state by telling the units, hey, now you're supposed to move there. But again, the unit doesn't actually move until we process the magic command, which is advanced time. Well, it's, it's actually, tell you a name is like a, a, a turn tech, which is like tick a turn. Again, we started by being a bold game. And once you uh, uh, and, and once the, the game takes a turn, uh, then everything goes and then the orders are executed, the unit moves, et cetera, et cetera. And then after that, that's what we do in the handle input. And then the rest of the loop is basically update the UI in the graphics and then render the results and then go at it again. That's basically what's happening when you when you see the, the, the loop going. So again, basically what I said, the game, the game set can only change through command execution. Uh, the player interaction to the UI uh, actually just queue commands to be executed by the command processor. If you are in single player, you are the, the server. If you are in multiplayer, it's sent over the wire, and then the server acknowledged back that you can that is actually time to execute that because it's all it's all server authoritative in time of like which order the the, the sequence is executed. Uh, and yeah, and and from time to time, the servers and only the server queues a command on top of whatever, uh, regardless of the player input, saying hey. It's time to advance. It's time to be the next hour, and depending on the time setting, you go. It does that more or less fast at the more or less uh, execution. So yeah, we have ticks, and ticks depend on the game. So uh, if Hoi four has ticks that are an hour, CK and uh, sorry, I keep saying Hoi CK and EU. I apologize. Hoi is Hearts of Fire, and CK is Crusader King. Uh, EU is Europe Universalis. You might also hear me pronounce an imperator, a Roman imperial name. That's the code name of the game before it was in when it was in development. Uh, feel free to ask if you don't know what I mean by that. Uh, I, there's no there's no risk now that they have been released, so the code names are kind of irrelevant. Uh, yeah. So Hearts of Iron takes every hour. Uh, a tick is an hour. Uh, Crusader Kings in Europe Universalis. The tick is a day. And on Stellaris, we have a, a weird system where it's basically a tenth of a day. And the reason we do that is that we simulate ship battles and missiles in flight and stuff like that. So we figured out very early that simulating by the day was basically making everything jump. 
And basically, you have nine, 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 ten out of uh, nine, nine ticks out of ten are just there to make the ships move, and only one of them is the big update where the rest of the thing run like the economy, the production, and uh, and, and everything. And there is no in between. You are either on uh, February uh, February fourth at thirteen o'clock, or when it passes, you are at fourteen. There is nothing in between. The, the the state between the two does not exist. You cannot make a save in between the two. It is not even consistent until it's done. And this is a very important thing for our for our, for our frame model. So if I open this in, in the profiler, and if you were at my talk yesterday, you might recognize Optech. This is what a frame looks like, uh, and and how how basically a simulation of an error uh, happens. I think we're being joined by my co-host today. His name is Max. I uh, should have warned you that it might happen. Say hello, Max. Do you like House of Fire, Max? Yeah, I bet you do. What's your favorite country? Hmm. Anyway, um, so you can see that the bit at the top here is the session update. So basically, it's executing a command, and that command in this case is hourly update. So basically, simulate an error in the world. Uh, here you have uh, the UI, the 3D, the input update, because it's actually not that, 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 that long for us to, comp to compute. And then you have the rendering, which is just render whatever has been computed before. And that's basically it. So as you can see, on the CPU side, all games are mostly bottlenecked by how fast we can update the simulation of the world. That is, this is mainly what the concern is. And you can also see the threads, and you can see that some bits are reasonably good at using multi-threading. Some other bits are actually single-threaded. That includes uh, the rendering and the, and the UI update for most parts, and some systems uh, in the game that we have not managed or we had, we had not made uh, parallel at the time. So each subsystem update is running a sequence. So for example, you see that we first we update the, we update the supply system. Uh, w is the weather. Uh, then there's the simulation of the uh, of the air. So like uh, airplanes and, uh, and air combat. I can't remember what this one is. Uh, it might be the navies. I think it's the navies. Uh, and then you have the simulation per country. Uh, so we have a different subsystem that also simulates. And finally, the AI subsystem is one. So the core utilization in this generation of game depends entirely of how the system was implemented. Whoever implemented it, if they bothered and managed to implement it using multi-threading, good. It's gonna be it's gonna be probably like those ones. It's gonna use most of the calls if it can. And if it wasn't implemented that way, like some of the other systems, then it's not. And most of the multi-threading is simply done by a parallel four. That's the that's the base idea. We we take a, a, a huge collection of entities that we need to update, and we just do parallel for all those entities update. That is basically the gist of it. So basically, the rule of a thumb is usually the more recent the system is, the better it is at uh, at, at at threading efficiency because the more we were uh, uh, sensible uh, sensitized to the to the idea that it needs to be done. And that it needs to be fit. Some other systems have been retrofitted, but not all of them have. And the UI and the graphics are not done in the dedicated thread, and they do not use multi-threading because uh, because for the longest time we were using old renderers that are not even super great at like, that don't really like multi-threading, like DirectX 9 and other old stuff. We are still uh, coming from a board game. The first Europe, uh, Paradox game ever was an adaptation of Europa Universalis, the board game, which you can see a a game being played on the right. I, this is not a, a game I played personally. I found this on Board Game Geek. Uh, the, the insane amount of, of, of counters and things is probably the reason we are all here today at my company, is that somebody looked at this and, and said, this is madness. You should simulate this on a computer. Uh, because they, just look at this. So yes, the problem is a lot of the logic... To some extent, the, the, the heritage is still there, especially in the old, older title. And board games are very turn-based. It's really like, OK, like, you know, you open your rule book sheet and you say, OK, sequence number five, update the units. And then you go with all the units one by one. You follow the rules, and then you continue. It is, it is how it's made. And so some of the, for example, some of the combats uh, or unit sequence rely on uh, determinism to, uh, to be working. So for example, Germany has to move their units before France does, that kind of thing. We, meaning it's harder for us to multi-thread because there is a dependency order. And it is hard to address in an existing game, especially a game like Hearts of Fire one that was released five years, uh, uh, yeah, five years ago, but probably in development for even more. 
Like it's there, the game design relies on it and changing it after the facts is non-trivial. So uh, another issue is the, the grain size. Like how big are the entities, how many do you have? Usually when we update by province or by state, it's fine because we have 13,000 provinces, uh, 800 states, and technically 300 countries, although it's 300 possible countries and roughly half of those are actually active at one time. The other ones are just there in case they, they start existing, but they're not present at the beginning of the game. Uh, and as you can see, not all those uh, entities are created equal. Uh, on the right, you have, for example, the aircraft production of World War II. This is just an approximate I pulled of the internet, but that gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, the US industry is like this, the German industry is like this, then you have USSR, UK, Japan, and then you have everybody else. And that's only the first time. And what it tells you is that if you try to put that in a, even if you try to parallel for this, you will immediately see that some of them will take basic, like, for example, the time to update the USA will probably time the time to update most of the others after the top 10, due to the sheer number of, uh, of factories or uh, units or, uh, or production lines that it has to, uh, to, to, to simulate. It also turns some optimization into pessimization. For example, uh, a common optimization before multifolding that, that we like to do is that instead of updating, updating something every day, you would update it every hour, but you would only update one, one in 24 units every, 20, uh, every 24 hours. So you would do a modular operation. The problem with that is that basically every hour you're, you're slowed by the slowest uh, unit to, uh, by the slowest uh, country to update and all the others are done by one or two threads. So it is, it is kind of a, it's kind of a problem because like, the way we kind of want to see it is like this, right? You want to update all the countries, so you do a parallel with all the countries. Then you update all the units, you do a parallel with all the units. Let's say you have three cores. Uh, and then you want to update the provinces, you do a parallel for all the provinces. That's, that's the rough idea. But the problem is it's not actually what, it, what, what happens. Usually it happens more like this, especially for like countries, for example. It is, you, you have one country that takes all that stuff, and then those two are just taking one and two. So yeah, you can still get something out of three cores, but you would probably not get much more than by having two. And this is the same idea. 16 cores or eight cores are probably not gonna change much because at the end of the day, you have like three or four big countries to simulate and all the other ones can be done like in a fraction of that time. <laughs> so the model has limitations. Entities within a system are not equal. Uh, you only as fast as the slowest entity to update. Uh, Excuse me, Max has decided that we need to go back because he didn't understand the slides before. Uh, yes, sorry, Max, but we need to move on, I'm afraid. So let's go back here. There we go. So as I was explaining to you and Max, uh, system updates will all only as fast as the uh, slowest entity to updates, even if you have a lot of cores, even if you have 16, 20, 32 cores. Large entities in one system also like tend to be big in other system because we often use the same uh, base breakdown. We usually break down updates by country because that's the easiest thing for designers to, uh, to reason about. And so if updating the production in the USA is probably the biggest thing, that the, the thing that takes the most time, updating the supply is probably also going to be uh, the biggest with the USA. And same thing for the US units. Because if they have the bigger production, it's likely that they have the most territory, the, more fact, the most factories, the most planes to simulate in, in battle and the most division deployed on the battlefield. So it kind of it kind of shows some limitation at some point. It doesn't scale that well. It was still good enough for the time. And that's kind of where I want to stop with the summary of that era. Some system managed to utilize these all uh, to utilize all the cores without too many problems. You've, you've seen with the, with the previous profiles that on an eight core machine, I still managed to get pretty decent core utilization on the newer things we've done. Uh, but refitting older system can be difficult. And unless you're willing to revisit slash, by revisit, I'm politely saying just change uh, and or redo some designs, you can't really easily uh, change them. And you have to deal with the fact that, for example, the unit update is, is based on the sequential algorithm. And that cannot change. So with all that in mind, let's see how we did recently in CK3. So uh, the first thing to note is that why they were not released at the same time. There was a point in Paradox where both Imperator, Crystal King 3, and Victoria 3 were in development. Uh, Imperator released first, then it was CK, and Victoria is almost there, but it's not there yet. So 
basically, it's not like one of them could take the uh, learnings of one of the other in production and apply them because they were all past the point where the base design was done when the first one released, which was Imperator. So uh, it's basically the same engine, but they had taken different approaches to the simulation, which allowed me to study the free and see, okay, which, which one wins. Uh, so the good news with the new game loop is that we finally have a render thread. Uh, we, we, we join everybody else in the, in the 21st century. So we have a main thread that is basically uh, handling the input, updating the, um, the UI and, and rendering. And then we have a session thread that is just processing commands. Of course, it is not as simple as that because, uh, because again, we, can, we have to make changes and we have to make sure there is, a, there is an atomistic guarantee. So in practice, it looks kind of like that, which is you log the game states to be able to handle the inputs and update the UI because you, have, you, have, you need at least a read lock. You need a guarantee that while you're processing command or updating, the, the data will not change. And then you unlock and then you can render with whatever you stashed. And when you're trying to process a command, it's the same thing. You have to log the game state to be able to modify it. That's that's the rough idea. There is some subtlety that I will explain, but that's the that's the base issue, right? You, you can't just put two things on two threads and hope it will work. You have some synchronization. So you get at least some uh, degree of multi-threading, especially since the rendering you know, new games is usually more complex and there's more stuff on the GPU. So anytime the it's it's you, anytime it's GPU work, the game is not stalling. It, it, can, it, it can start preparing, rendering the next update, for example. But it does not solve uh, the biggest bottleneck, which is the, uh, the game state update out of the box. It's still, it's still this big one thing here, and it all entirely depends on how these updates have been made. And of course, there is mutexes, and nobody loves mutexes. If you remember my talk last year about the Stellaris performance startup, I did not like mutexes at the time, and I don't like them either today. So, it doesn't look much better on practice, on, on paper. Let's see how it did. So first I'm gonna shut down this one and then I'm gonna treat you with some Crusader King 3. No, not the beta, I'm gonna run the live. Play. This allows me to drink a bit. Again, I wish you could hear the music, but not an option right now. Okay, time for a new game. So, Crusader King, it's, uh, it's about the medieval age, right? So, uh, two, two star dates are offered to you, 867, which is like the, 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 the Norseman, and uh, 1066, which is the fate of England and, uh, and things like that. So, let's, do, let's, let's just play as any ruler in 1066, and actually, we're just going to observe it. We're not gonna even play anyone. We're just gonna observe it. So, same thing as the previous one, except it's uh, it's medieval Europe and Asia. Uh, you can see most of the world, and it looks like it is very simple. But you can actually zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom, and then you get some pretty nice graphics when you get closer. And if you want to see more detail, you can zoom out and you can see the duchies, or you can see the kingdoms, or you can see the empires, depending on what you want. You can see the religions, the cultures, the houses and power, etc., etc., etc. Uh, so it's 1066, and what happened in 1066? Well, this guy happens. His name is uh, William the Bastard, uh, which will be very soon known as uh, William of England, the, the, the man who conquered England. And so it's September 10, uh, September 15, 1066. And every character in the world uh, is simulated, every county in the world, and every sub-county barony in the world uh, gets, gets simulated and stuff happens. How fast can it go? Let's unpost it. So as you can see, uh, William should be uh, getting war on England now. Yes, he is. He's starting a war uh, to uh, invade England. You can see that he has. He should start landing troops quite soon. Yeah, there he is. He's starting to occupy some stuff. So yeah, he, he's he's fighting the war and he's and he's trying to um, to conquer England as uh, as the real uh, William the Bastard did. And while I was talking, this like I don't know, thirty seconds, two years have passed. So that gives you an idea of how fast CK3 is. And, and honestly, the first time I benchmarked it, I thought there was a bug. I thought there was a bug, and I thought the bug was uh, like, your game is not running, or it's not simulating anything. But it is. Look, this guy is actually trying to conquer England. And oh, he's about to win, actually. I think he probably got uh, someone captured or something, because he's got most of the, 
most of the world scholars said, oh, he's occupying the enemy capital and he captured the heir of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the king. So I think he's, he's about to become king of England at any time, but I'm not going to wait for it because, again, it's a random game and it may or may not, uh, lot, lots of things can happen there. Uh, so let's not wait more than that. So that just gives you an idea. And there we go. Four years have happened while I was talking just about that. So that gives you an idea of just roughly how fast CK2, CK3E does. So now the question is how? <clears throat> so this is how the profile looks like on CK3, uh, again, on an eight core machine. So you can see that the thread utilization is pretty good. Uh, you can see that there is about, uh, we're trying to use the CPU as much as we can, and there's not much locking. Uh, the locking, you can see, it's, it's very hard to see, I think, on your monitor here. It's the green part. It's the synchronized bit. It's, it's the bits where you actually need a game state lock, and all the other ones are not. And that's that's the beauty of, uh, of CK3. There is two or, few thing, uh, two or three things that were discovered using the command system when CK3 was in development that made those updates Go fast. The first thing is that you might see that the updates are done by system, and not by uh, and not by entity. So it's harder to see, but you can see, for example, when simulating a day here, uh, we have the character system. The characters are being simulated on one thread. The AI is being simulated on one thread. The cultures are being simulated on one thread. The uh, I can't remember what open. I think it's the it's the plots. The the, the plots are simulating on one thread, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically, we kind of taken the, the update model of uh, of um, of the older game and we flipped it on its head like 90 degrees. So basically, instead of updating uh, all the countries, then all the units, and then all the province, we say, you update all the countries, you update all the units, you update all the provinces. And that makes a lot of things go faster because you're not stuck by, uh, by the fact that maybe one system is parallel and the other isn't. And maybe one system cannot be made parallel because it has like dependency execution order or something. It doesn't matter. We guarantee that every entity in the system is gonna is gonna is gonna be uh, is gonna be done in a deterministic order, which solves a lot of issues, especially with multiplayer. Uh, and then we just feed the CPUs by saying, "Hey, you're done. I guess I have another system to compute." So, the base principle is. Uh, there is a read part and a, uh, there is a read lock uh, part and a, and a write lock part every time we run an update in the game when we when you simulate the passage of the day. So the read lock part says, okay, your update can change what it wants as long as it's not visible. So basically, you owe the read lock to the game state. So whatever you do, it can't be visible. Uh, no system querying any data property anywhere can see the difference from the day before. So that's that's what makes it makes it possible for every system to run at the same time, because nobody's actually uh, changing anything visibly. It's all is saved to a stash. Uh, and then you have a write log part, which is the synchronized bit, where everybody takes these private values, the stash, and makes it visible, so that the next time you have a public query, you will actually see the value. And then it's all an effort from the programmers to say, hey update and compute as much as you can in the in the read log part and as little as possible in the write log part. We would like the write log to be mostly a copy. You can see it as a double buffered system. It kind of is, but it's a bit different because there is reason why we can't do a full double buffer game state or triple buffer game state for that matter. Uh, the main reason is that there's just too much data to copy and we can't do that in a reasonable time. So um, there are several benefits with that. The first one, as I mentioned, is that entities within a system are guaranteed to be updated in a deterministic sequential order, which solves a lot of issues we have uh, when we try to thread uh, existing system in the past, which is there is a chance that there is actually a dependency we didn't know about. And then two clients will execute two updates in a different order because we don't have the same CPU count, blah, 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 and they get out of sync. Uh, and again, the read lock uh, can be parallelized with every system update, and it can be parallelized with all the rendering and the input updates, which means you can even keep rendering frame if you want. It doesn't matter. And it has proven to be very good, especially with, uh, with new programmers. Uh, I don't know about your companies, but as every company, I think COVID had brought its share of turnover, and especially new people that you have to onboard while not being in the same office or in the same town for that matter. And it turned out that we have not uh, uh, seen a lot of uh, 
difficulty for new programmers to get accustomed to this because you only have to teach them two very simple things. You tell them, try to put much as your update as you can in the read lock. And once you have the, and when you're holding the read lock, you can't modify anything public. You have to put everything in the stash structure and that's it. That's all we have to teach them. And then whatever they write out of the box is thread safe enough for CK3 to be able to run it and parallelize it uh, over as many calls as you want. <clears throat> and that has been a, a very, very good boon because the, the, the problem we've seen in the past is that when you task someone that is not does not have some seniority in the company or in video game in, in, in development in general to make a new system, it will start by being an iterative, simple approach because that's the simplest to think. And then he might try to make it parallel with a parallel four and realize that it has all the dependency and he has to think his model differently or put locks and it becomes much more hard, much harder for, for, for them to think about it. With this model, we just say, hey, don't, don't, don't rack your head too much. Just, just make your system follow those two simple rules and we guarantee we're gonna thread your thing, uh, no problem. The other games I've tried something different, which I'm not gonna delve into it too much because after analysis, I think CK3 is the most potential. Uh, Imperator had a model that was fairly similar to the previous generation. It just had the benefit of having a rendering thread. Uh, and Victoria 3 is still in development. Uh, it is, I think, functionally more clo closer to the, to the older system with a twist on how it's modeled. But again, I, I think it's a bit early to, to, to have entire uh, conclusions because again, the game is not released and uh, it will probably get a few optimization passes uh, from here to release. But the, 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 the big takeaway we, we, I got from, uh, from studying all this is that the, best you, uh, the, the, the better for the efficiency uh, is, clearly, uh, is clearly there. Even when we have uh, old school uh, update patterns, the fact that we have a render file still makes a better call usage. But CK3 really pushed it to another limit. Like we haven't had uh, anybody complaining about the game speed. Like people complaining about how fast the game can simulate uh, turns uh, when they, when they, because you know, it doesn't matter that the world has things has thing happening. If the player has nothing happening, he just wants the game to go fast to get to the best that he cares. So if he's playing a country that is not part of a big global war happening, the game still has to, 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 to simulate that big global war. And the player just wants it over because he wants to be to the bit where he can actually participate. And we don't want to cheat by simulating less when the player is not involved. That's that's just not our approach. We're still trying to be simulationist. And so we have to simulate it whether the player interacts with it or not. And that is why in CK3, we never had any complaint because the most complaint we have is that actually Speed 5 is too fast. And that most people say it's basically unplayable because it goes too fast. Uh, and the model is easy enough to teach. The only issue I might have is that it is not enforced by the API. So if you're not taught how to use it, you can still fall back into the old pattern and end up with single, uh, single uh, locked uh, commands that are kind of inefficient. And with all that in mind, let's look at what my thoughts are after studying all this and how, how we could do even more in the future. Uh, the first thing is obviously to look at the at the differences uh, between between what Hoy can do and CK3 can do. This is VTune on my machine. So bear in mind that VTune think that the ideal for utilization on my machine should be 16 calls all the time. I think it's cute, but I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, but even then you can see that CK3 has, a, has an interesting bell curve that is centered around five. While you can see that hearts of iron for all, uh, for all the things it managed to parallelize and uses with many threads, it is still, mostly one thread in many places. Um, there is also a small bias in, uh, there's also a small bias in, uh, in, in CK3 because the, the new threading API we, we use is uh, more aggressive in the way it uh, spins down and shuts down thread while uh, Hoy is using TBB, which goes to sleep much more faster. But you, so you don't see as much like spinning that looks like CPU usage. But still, CK3 has proven to be much more efficient at using threads all the time. So with that in mind, I think that since CK3 has proven to be very reliable in production for like more than a year now with no complaint, I think this is the way we should continue. Uh, and this is, this is what I've been encouraging uh, the, the, the next games to do. Uh, and we are obviously studying that uh, very closely for the next potentially unannounced uh, thing we might be working on or not. 
Um, we don't have a big limitation to solve. Uh, the system on itself works. So my first focus would be to try to make it more accessible as a design pattern. So uh, the design pattern is there, but it's not formalized. There's no update API that force you to, uh, to use it. For example, Imperator is based on the same engine, and it just does the old updated system one by one and then do a parallel four if you can. It's not formalized. You can use the same engine and get different results. So I think the next step for us uh, would be to generalize it. The next step would be, uh, let's try uh, the same model in the next title, whatever it is, to just prove that it still works. And you know, don't, don't generalize something if you only have one usage, right? This is the rule number one of, uh, of, of software development, maybe rule number two, uh, you might disagree, but I think one of the base rules is do not generalize something that has only one use case. But as soon as we start getting another, uh, another title that is, that is like past the prototype stage enough to use it uh, and, and, and shows promise, then uh, we will probably be looking at making, extracting the commonality and making an API that is based on that and say, hey, if you use that model, the compiler will scream at you if you try to get out of the bounds. Like for example, if you're, in the, if you're using the read update, like you will literally only have const access to the game state. You will not be able to, uh, to, to mutate anything. The only thing you will have is a second variable that has some kind of stash and that variable you can write to. And then in the next, uh, in the next, uh, in the in the sync update, you will get that variable back, and you will have to propagate it. We can we can think about something like basically make the buffering system uh, the double buffer, if you will. It's not true, but a double buffer, but it kind of is. It's it's more of a work stash thing. Uh, make it a bit more part of the actual model, which is not now. Uh, probably rename the interfaces because I don't know if you saw in the profile, it was really small, but I think the name is pre-update and update, pre-update being the lockless one and update being the, 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 the locked one. It's not super obvious to a newcomer what the, what the main names mean. So we probably could also use a few better naming in there. And then we can start thinking about the future, right? Because again, the CPU curve keeps, uh, keeps growing. The, the average, uh, the, the target for CK3 is eight cores, but Anything we start developing tomorrow will probably take four years, five years, I don't know, three to five, depending on how, how good we go and, uh, and, and, and how well uh, a lot of things happens. But what our CPU is going to look like? What's going to be the steam uh, average in five years? I would wager it's probably going to be 16 cores, something like that. Today, 16 cores is clearly more like a, a high end. I think it's probably going to be the middle ground in five years. Roughly, I don't. I, 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 I don't want to make too, big, too too many productions because uh, they never turn out to be right. But this is the idea, right? So, can we do better? Can we try to push that even faster, uh, even further? So maybe we can have even more complex simulations. So, just for uh, for the sake of science, I put CK3 on this machine this time. I uh, I, I imported a, a special build with uh, with instrumentation, and I run the profiler, and you start seeing slowly some 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 lack of a potential issue, which is that you start having a bunch of tasks that are basically waiting. Because you basically have, if two systems are slower than all the systems combined, then you can't really thread more than that. You have to wait for them to finish. And so basically the idea would be, okay, Right now, the entities uh, the entities are allowed to look at each other and be updated in sequence. But maybe not all subsystems need that because, as we've seen in the past, we've managed to 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 to, to turn some some updates into per, per, uh, entirely parallel. I will not look at any other entity uh, in in the game. So, if we can drop the order of uh, the order of execution execution requirement and uh, you're allowed to look at each other, then we can actually split the big system update into into smaller batches, and we can consider those smaller batches an actual task that you can schedule. And basically, if you start having three systems that you're that you're simulating, and you can see that the last one is start, clearly starting to be the the bottleneck, if we can split that into like you know, if we can remove the whole system and start seeing batches instead, and say okay, maybe we can take like six and seven and consider them uh, like another batch, and then we can put this other batch here, and then we we end up one cycle early. 
and we can uh, we, we can refine the you can refine the same model on a, on a larger scale, of course, because uh, we usually have more than eight uh, entities to update. But you, you get the gist of it. So basically, um, my idea would be to refine uh, define a subsystem uh, update requirement. Say, okay, this subsystem it requires uh, in order or not uh, the entities need to be able to access each other, yes or no. You get a different API for that. And if you satisfy more, basically, if you have more constraints, like kind of in the concept sense, if you are like the same way, you know, when you when you do an algorithm, it looks at the iterator type. If the iterator is uh, is, is random access, it's going to do a lot of very uh, fancy stuff because it knows it can jump between memory. If you give it something that is uh, that is only an input iterator that has to go all the way, uh, it will it will use some more conservative algorithm that are less efficient. Basically, the same idea. If you say, hey, update all those entities, you can look at that and say, hey, those one don't, or, or basically they are like uh, you don't have to read them one by one. You can you can you can uh, you can do them in any order. Then we can change the way the schedule and we can start saying, oh, you're allowed to chunk the thing. You're allowed to chunk the thing and you're allowed to split it into several. Basically, uh, the idea would be to uh, to double down on the uh, on, on, on what CK3 started and make it more explicit uh, in the API. And with that, it's time to wrap up just, just on the clock. So my conclusion would be using a modern CPU uh, efficiently requires good score utilization today. You can't get away uh, with just single frame computation anymore. I think even the games we published 10 years ago and maybe even five if you're pushing it could have gotten away to some extent. Now it's clearly not possible. Uh, Parallel 4 will help you, especially if your architecture is a bit older and that's the best you can do. You can, you can get something out of it. It's a, it's, a, it's a very solid clutch, if I have to call it a clutch. You can, you can do a bunch of that, but it only carries you so far. And after that, you need to start thinking of adopting a different model that is more thread, uh, uh, thread friendly and basically enforce, friend, uh, enforce constraints on the, uh, on the model that is that makes them threat, threat, threat framing by, uh, by definition. Um, and furthermore, I still think your build should be destroyed. Thanks. Without over subscribing, I have a question here. Without over subscription, how do you handle high latency tasks that will take more than one tick to finish? Uh, we, we, I, I don't think we do. Uh, I don't think we have anything of that of that case. If you have a high, like the only high latency task we could have would be like loading stuff, like assets. But the solution that all games have is that usually we just front load everything, like models, textures, units. We just load everything at the at the, at the start. We have been looking at doing some more smarter streaming, but as far as I know, uh, it's it's more like something that is in progress and not something that is done. So we have background threads um, that we can fire if, if something needs to be done on the side. It is not really like tied to the actual update system. But if something is needed to actually up, do an update, uh, then we just have to wait on it. And the best we can do is just render a few frames in between to keep the illusion that the, the, the thing is going. But in practice, you will see that the times kind of slow down and it takes a bit more time to, to, to actually um, to actually uh, um, uh, properly uh, progress. Do we have more questions? We have one more minute and then it's gonna be up. Oh, there is one. Have you looked at coroutines to run on your threads? No, because coroutines are just way too new for something to be used in our games at this point. Uh, it is something that could be interesting to look at in the future, but given the support of coroutines right now and the compilers we're using and the potential, uh, always uh, potential that we will or will not ship on console one day, uh, we have not looked at coroutines. All right, do you have mobile CPU usage? like power versus performance requirements. Uh, we do have some people using mobile CPU, but I was actually looking at the statistics the other day uh, to, to look at the uh, potentially updating minimum system requirements for the game. 
And it turns out that even the people who play on mobile, uh, like and by mobile, uh, it will. I think by mobile, I will only see laptops. We don't have anybody playing on actual mobile. My platforms are like Windows, Mac, Linux, desktop, and laptops. And so even the worst uh, laptops people play on are usually still like mid, mid, mid-range gaming laptops that are good enough for this. And with that, we're out of time. Uh, we'll take the other questions uh, in uh, in Gatotown.